Welcome one and all. As in, stop talking now and welcome one and all. Um, <laughs> it's a great pleasure, um, to a uh, great pleasure and honour for me to be um, um, introducing Fred Turner today. I'll say a few words about Fred in a minute. Uh, I just want to give you a few ground rules that we'll be having. Uh, first of all, the talk, then some time for questions. Then we're going to whisk um, uh, Fred down to the fifth floor where there is wine and cheese and assorted uh, beverages and food available. Um, so we'll ask you not to cluster around him after the talk, um, but to follow him downstairs um, um, to the um, site of Sybaritic Delights. Um, we have got a terrific um, speaker series this year. Last, last week we were lucky enough to have Kevin Phillip, who gave a wonderful talk. Uh, next week it's going to be uh, Leisha Pelan uh, from the University of uh, Colorado at Boulder speaking on frontiers in crisis informatics. But today's speaker is Fred Turner. Um, I feel that I've known Fred since he was knee high to a grasshopper, but looking at him I don't believe he was ever knee high to a grasshopper. Um, but um, he was in my Department of Communication at UCSD when I first moved there, and he came in as a very accomplished journalist. He'd written this wonderful book about Vietnam called Echoes of, Con uh, Echoes of Contact, The Vietnam War and American Memory. Uh, he then went on to um, what I think is a foundation work uh, for understanding the network society that we live in today, which is uh, from counterculture to cyberculture, Stuart Brand, the whole Earth Network, and the rise of digital utopianism. And his most recent work, which he'll be drawing on today, but he'll be expanding on, so if you've read the book, you don't need to go home, um, <laughs> is the democratic surround, multimedia and American liberalism from World War II to the psychedelic 60s. Um, so, with no further ado, can I introduce Fred, who's going to speak today about the politics of interactivity in Cold War America. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you all very much. Um, thank you, Jeff, and thank you to the Bren School for having me. Um, I feel incredibly lucky to be here and incredibly honored to be here, um, partly because uh, Jeff actually is one of my, my teachers and my mentors. Um, I was the graduate student who drove Jeff to a job at UCSD years ago. <laughs> Changed my life. Okay. But also in, a, in, a, in an even deeper way, because I'm, by inclination and training, a cultural historian, an American cultural historian. And it's hard to think of anything that has changed American culture more completely than the work of computer scientists and the ideas that computer scientists have brought into the world. And ironically, in the, histo the history world that I come from, technology is often sort of shunted off to the side. So shunted off that there's a separate society for the history of technology. Mainstream American Historical Association doesn't even have a section. We're thinking about this, okay? Um, so, and, and yet I'm sitting here thinking this is you know, one of the most important things that we have in our culture today. So my sort of broad work is oriented toward trying to figure out how to bring the cultures of computing and the cultures of America more broadly from outside the technical world back together analytically, the way they are actually lived. Um, so that's our work today. Um, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes. Um, if you have questions of fact as I move, please jump right in. But if you have more conceptual questions, please hold them back. We will have time for Q&A afterwards here, and then I'll be uh, very happy to drink and think down um, below afterwards. That would be great. I'd do better with a glass of wine in my hand. <laughs> uh, talk today is going to have three parts. I'm going to start with something that may sound a little odd given how new Facebook actually is. I think Facebook presents us, presents us historians with a problem. How was it that the modes of interactivity on which Facebook depends came to seem like good things? In the wake of Edward Snowden, I think we're very aware of the power of state surveillance. We're also very aware, I think, in the wake of scholars like Shoshana Zuboff um, and her notion of surveillance capitalism, of the ways in which <laughs> watching one another, interacting with one another, generate new modes of making money and new relationships with institutions charged with making money. In that context, how did we ever come to believe that interactivity was the key to happiness? I'm going to go back and try to look at a moment when that was the case. And that moment, I'm going to argue, is World War II, strangely enough. 
Um, World War II is a moment, and I'll, I'll talk much more about this in a moment, but World War II is a moment that we may associate with a kind of rise of American power in the world, with John Wayne, with a kind of driven masculine style. What we don't remember, and what astonished me when I went back into the archives, was how radical the period actually was. It was a period in which, as we confronted the fascists of Germany, we confronted the racism in our own society. We confronted the gender stereotyping in our own society, such that in the years immediately after the war, there was a broad hope for a new kind of utopian United States. That view, much more widely shared than anyone remembers, helped drive the rise of the counterculture, and through the counterculture, the rise of the modes of collaborative computing that we work with today. And that's the case I'm going to make. And that's where I'm going to end the story. I'm going to end the story really in the 60s, um, but with, with implications for the present. And I'm going to do something that's, that's not in the Democratic Surround book, but that I hope will be helpful for, for this group. I'm going to kind of um, try to weave together the history of the politics and aesthetics of interactivity writ large in media and culture with more specific histories of computing. Computing and the arts have actually been entwined in lots of complicated and very interesting ways. I'm going to point out a couple of them here today um, to make the case as concretely as I can that computation, the culture of computation and the culture of the United States have been entwined for decades, shaping one another in ways that at least most American historians don't take sufficient account of. So that's where we're headed today. Okay, so far so good? Okay, everybody can hear me okay? All right, good, we're underway. So, let's start with Facebook. Um, Facebook is a funny case. I, I, I think it's kind of paradigmatic. It's paradigmatic of a world in which we are constantly surrounded by screens. Um, I see some screens in the room today. I'm carrying a screen in my pocket. Um, through these screens, we are offered the opportunity to, and I, I use this, this horrible verb in full awareness of its bland utility, connect. We are offered the chance to connect with each other. <coughs> Fine. Um, but as we connect with each other, we inhabit a world surrounded by screens that also offer us not only the opportunity, but the obligation to do our most personal business in commercially sponsored environments under the watchful eye of both corporations and the state. Unless you're a regular Tor user, and even then, it's tough to, 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 to escape that view. Facebook, I think, is interesting because it argues that everyone wants to network, everyone wants to be in touch with one another, and that out of that being in touch will come a new and better, a more egalitarian, more widely shared American democracy. But it makes that argument in a world that is, in its technical sense, commercially sponsored, ubiquitous, and inescapably monitored and monetized. And that, I think, presents a historical problem for us. How did egalitarian interactivity come to be, together with monitoring and monetization, the emblem of a new democratic possibility? Where did that idea emerge? Where did that combination come into being? And that's where I want to take us today. So the key question is, how did we get here? Um, <laughs> Thanks, appreciate that. Um, I'll pay you later. That's great. Um, a little bit of context. Um, Jeff gave you a little bit of an introduction. So I was a journalist for 10 years, um, and then over the last 10 years, I've been involved in what I think of as a kind of a single project, trying to trace the cultural intersections of computing and American cultural change as they've occurred. Um, I did a book called From Counterculture to Cyberculture that ended in the 90s with the rise of the internet and the early World Wide Web. And while I was working on that book, I was shocked to discover that my heroes in the book, leading figures <coughs> in the counterculture of the 60s, did not, in fact, reject the world of the 1940s and 50s. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I was always told that the 60s were a special time, that they bubbled up in response, in sort of full technicolor glory, in response to um, a, a black and white, dull, McCarthyite, conservative 40s and 50s. That's the story I was told. Imagine my surprise when I was studying Stuart Brand, who was the founder of the Whole Earth Catalog, or other figures, Ken Kesey, um, uh, Todd Gitlin, a bunch, bunch of leaders, th to see that they were reading books from the 40s for inspiration. Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, they were reading Margaret Mead. They were reading Eric Fromm, psychologist, a Freudian psychologist. Karen Horney, another psychologist. They were reading Ruth Benedict, Margaret Mead's um, teacher, lover, colleague. 
they were reading a very interesting group of folks. And above all, they were reading Norbert Wiener, mm -hmm. the cyberneticist. So, I'll just, okay, quick, quick, quick hit against reviewers. My book, From Counterculture to Cyberculture, like half the people who reviewed it said, wow, it's great. Turner finally showed us how the hippies brought us computers. That's not what I did. Okay? What I think I did, and I'll tell you, because you guys will get this in a way that the non-technical crowd won't, what I think actually happened was that the research, the collaborative research world of the 40s brought us hippies. And that hippies brought us the legitimacy that, that computing acquired in the 80s and 90s. I think it's a weird trade that occurs over about 50 years. But I actually think the driving force here is the rise of research culture, not the rise of cool. All right, moving on. Sorry, that was a bit of a headliner. Um, so I finished this book. I'm three years into a job at Stanford. Um, I need to get tenure. I'm terrified. Um, and I hold up in a room, and I started following back the people that my crowd in the 60s had been reading. I just started reading them. I just read them and read them and read them and read them. And as I read them, a world opened up to me that I had not known existed. It was a world that was more liberal, more intellectually open, more devoted to egalitarian polity, to sexual diversity, to racial diversity, and to integrity than I had ever known. It was also a world devoted to multi-screen media. Again, a thing I had never heard about. So I'm going to take you back into that world today with an eye to showing you, I think, I hope, where Facebook comes from. Let's go back to just before World War II. Just before World War II, America had a problem. Actually, the world had a problem, and it was Germany. Hitler comes to power, and American intellectuals, journalists, government leaders are baffled. Until that time, they had seen Germany, even more than France or England, as the home of European culture. Germany had brought us Beethoven. Germany had brought us philosophy, romantic poetry. Germany was the home of high culture Europe. How was it that this most cultured of European nations should have fallen so hard for a short, mustachioed, whacked out former clerk? <laughs> like, how did that happen, right? And they really wanted to know. So there were a lot of theories at the time, and I think in retrospect, historians would argue that the Weimar era economic chaos had a lot to do with the search for order. Ironically, that wasn't the dominant theory in at least the press of the 1930s in the US. The dominant theory was actually about media. What people said was two versions of this. But they said that mass media brought us fascism in Germany. And there are a couple different accounts of how that worked. Um, the first account starts with um, what media are themselves. In this view, mass media, one to many broadcast media, so this is radio, but also at the time newspapers, one to many mass media, have a force, people argued, that is penetrating. It literally moves through your mind, past your reason, toward the then newly discovered unconscious. And it stirs up your unconscious, and according to pundits at the time, so cuts down your ability to reason that it stirs up your unconscious and makes you want to follow a leader. It fills you with uncontrollable desire to follow. Hmm. So that's just the medium itself, okay? Moreover, the medium itself puts you in a position that forces you to literally act out the logic of fascism. Now, the risk of upsetting you, um, this position is the one that we're all in right now, mm -hmm. where everyone's attention is more or less directed to a single point. And the fear at this time was that by getting together in a movie theater or even reading a newspaper, you were directing your attention toward a single point of power. And that, just by definition, put you in some version of what we might think of as the fascist situation. You were part of a mass staring at a power source. But that wasn't the only problem. The other problem was the people behind the microphones. So many people at the time actually thought that Hitler and his group were insane, were clinically insane. And they argued that, in fact, Hitler, had, um, Hitler and his cronies had managed to use mass media to send their madness through the ether into the minds of ordinary people. And you can actually get a feel for this, right, in Hermann Goering. Here he is depicted in Life magazine in 1935, uh, you could see him being what, from an American perspective, looks a little bit like crazy. To him, um, that's a very ordinary fascist speech-making pose. But here he is sending his madness out through the microphone. Now, the ability to convey emotions through the microphone wasn't limited to, the, to, to, to folks like Goering. I was shocked to discover, when I got into like Life magazine, Saturday Evening Post, other leading publications of the period, that they routinely referred to four fascists. 
Hitler, Mussolini, Tojo, and Roosevelt. Like Roosevelt as a fascist, right? Like, huh? So where's that coming from? Well, the fear was that Roosevelt himself was doing just what Goering was doing. Roosevelt, through his fireside chats, was manipulating our emotions in such a way that we would want to follow him at a personal level while he centralized our government in the wake of the Depression through the National Reconstruction Administration. Okay. So there's a definite fear that mass media makes us fascists. That fear was not entirely um, unfounded in a country where real fascists walked around all the time. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So, um, here's a, 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 an image of British fascists in the late 30s in Devon, England. I simply wanted you to see that they were there. Um, in my book, The Democratic Surround, though, I have pictures of other things that are, that are tremendously disturbing. Um, I don't know if you know, I didn't know before I started this work, that there were Nazi summer camps on Long Island. <laughs> that you could send your child or your family there, put on um, black shirt uniforms, and learn the proper salute. Okay. Um, I didn't know that in 1939, 22,000 Americans rallied in Madison Square Garden in the heart of Jewish New York in celebration of fascism. And they hung banners from the walls that said, stop Jewish domination of Christian America. I didn't know that after Hitler invaded Poland, after Hitler went into Poland, a thousand Americans marched down East 86th Street carrying American flags and swastikas, and they were not booed. They were not booed. There's a picture of that in the book, too. They were watched calmly, occasionally applauded. Think about what that means. Um, you probably know Humphrey Bogart, right? And uh, so Humphrey Bogart movie, quick, what, what hum name some Humphrey Bogart movies? Casablanca. Casablanca, what else? Big Sleep. Big Sleep, keep going. Multi-Spoken. multi, -spoken. multi -spoken, great, keep going. Key Largo. Key Largo, great. OK, we're getting to the weird ones now. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have seen The Black Legion? Not so widely known. <laughs> um, I caught it one night in the middle of the night. I hadn't even known it existed. Made in 1937. It's a film in which um, Humphrey Bogart plays a black shirt American fascist who kills his Polish neighbor. Um, and it's a movie that essentially takes seriously the theme, it can happen here. And my point here is that in the late 30s and early 1940s, there was a reasonably realistic fear that fascism could take place in the US and that if we deployed mass media on our people, they might, in fact, begin to turn in that direction. This fact creates a real dilemma for American leaders. We start to get to the edge of World War II. Hitler has been sending his panzers across Western Europe. Roosevelt begins to want to intervene. We begin to want to do propaganda on our own people in order to convince them to go to war against fascism. But how are we going to do that in a way that doesn't turn them into fascists? That's the question. Now, there's actually a faction in Roosevelt's um, inner circle um, who I found, found in the archives. I spent, a, I spent <laughs> way too long in the archives. <coughs> Happy to talk methods with any grad students here, but uh, I'm a guy who really likes the smell of dusty paper. <laughs> so there was a group in Roosevelt's circle that um, firmly believed that Goebbels was doing it right, and that we should do what Goebbels was doing. We, too, should have a mass-mediated propaganda enterprise, and we could deprogram our people later. That was the actual language. We'll deprogram them later. OK, we, we got to win the war. Got to get unity up. Goebbels knows how to do it. Let's copy and go. Fortunately, that was not actually the dominant faction. It wasn't a faction that won out. In resistance to that faction, there was another group, a group called the Committee for National Morale. And it was, uh, consisted of about 60 of mostly American social scientists and psychologists. And it was led by an art historian, Arthur <laughs> Upham Pope. Now, I mean, in our day, right, the idea of an, art, of, a, of an art historian leading a political movement, not so common. But go for it, right? I mean, it was very encouraging. So he gathered 60 of America's leading social scientists together in New York. They included people like Margaret Mead, her husband at the time, Gregory Bateson, Gordon Allport, who's a psychologist at Harvard at this point, and they take a different view. They take a very different view. They try to figure out what kind of media can we make that promote democracy. In order to understand how they frame that question, I need to do a, a brief intellectual digression. It's, it's, a little, it's going to be a little painful, but, but it's worth it, I think. These folks came from an intellectual tradition called culture and personality anthropology. And it's by uh, students of Franz Boas, who was a, an early 20th century, late 19th, Ameri uh, 
American, but anthropologists who worked in America. They, this group, this includes me, her teacher Benedict, believed that in every culture there was a modal personal style, a modal personality style. And that children raised within a culture were raised toward that style. And that media could help produce people in that style. So one of the reasons Germany had gone fascist in their view was that there was a German personality style that was a little authoritarian. If we were going to save America, we need to come up with a kind of media that would help us produce a more democratic personality style. And here's Gordon Allport talking about that. I love, I, love this, I love this passage. You can read it for yourself. But I want to flag two key words here. The first word is personality. In a democracy, every personality can be a citadel of resistance to tyranny. This is a really important notion, that resisting tyranny depends on your inner psychological state. Now, you may have heard the phrase from the 1960s, or you may have heard the argument that the 1960s was the time when the personal became political. That's not true. This is the time when the personal became political. Along with personality, I want you to see another word, and that is coordination. This is really interesting. Mass media and fascism shared a structural dynamic. One to many, top down, hierarchical. If we were going to produce democratic personalities, we needed not to direct them from above, but coordinate them in an egalitarian manner. I hope you just felt a chill run through the room. Mm -hmm. okay? Because this is the logic of Facebook. So how could we do this kind of coordination? Well, um, the Committee for National Morale, great thinkers. They wrote wonderful documents. They wrote books for Roosevelt, reports. Um, very, very, very visible during the war, um, not so much after. But they were not media makers. They were theorists. Lucky for them, there was a group of unemployed Bauhaus artists floating around Manhattan at this point. Starting in 1937, um, a couple of folks, particularly Herbert Beyer, who was the person who invented the all lowercase typeface that we associate with the Bauhaus and use so much today, um, were in New York and they needed work. And they brought with them to New York a very highly developed understanding of how to design multi-screen environments. Back in Germany, Herbert Beyer had designed this thing right here. He called it the diagram of the 360 degree field of vision. It's a really interesting thing. He used it for displays. He used it to display furniture. He hung chairs on the walls. He used it to display photographs in exhibitions in the late 1930s in Germany and, and abroad. And it's, it's organized along very different psychological principles than mass media. People feared that mass media uh, tore up your Freudian unconscious. And he said, yeah, forget all that. Multimedia work on gestaltist principles. Your job as a person is to walk around experiencing the world through your different senses. My feet feel one thing, my hand feels another, I look up, I look down. And then to integrate these experiences into your living body and being. And that's how you become you. You become you through a process of integration. Okay? So in, in Germany, Bayer and his team at the, at the Bauhaus built these environments so as to produce what they called the new man. The new man would be psychologically integrated under the assault of industrial life. Industrial life was tough, cities were hard, Germany was chaotic, it was the Weimar era. And so we'll build these environments to help people practice integrating themselves, become more psychologically sturdy in the face of industry. When he got to America, um, nobody was especially interested in the idea of a new man. It sounded very much like the Ubermensch. Okay, not such a good thing. But they were desperately interested in the democratic man. And Bayer and his team repurposed this design, this mode of organizing images, to help produce democratic personalities with the aid of the members of the Committee for National Morale. The first place this happened was here, the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1942. Now, again, in histories of computing's impact on culture, we tend not to think a lot about museum exhibitions. I'm here to tell you that museum exhibitions and computing have a, have a, have a, have a, have a history that's so entwined, it's, it's just, I get excited. 
it's, it's surprising. <laughs> so here we are in 1942. Um, Bayer is working with Edward Steichen, who is a famous photographer in his own right, goes on to design the family of man. And you can see here that the images are multi-sized. Um, and you, know, um, you walk through, you enter here, you walk by signs of America. It's, it's a show designed to help you see what America is like and develop some sympathy with it. For us, images of this kind are not that big a deal. But for viewers at this time, it's a huge deal. At this time, virtually all exhibitions of images proceed um, with eye-level images that you approach one at a time. So you see a photo, photo, encounter, good. Photo, encounter, good. Photo, encounter, good. And you walk on down the line. Here, you don't actually do that. You can see that you have some images below you, some images above you, and you're constantly moving at your own pace down a road. Now, again, in our own time, this kind of road might look quite controlling. Wait, I'm supposed to go forward. I must pass the images in the sequence that you tell me. But in that time, viewers read it as liberation. 80,000 people went to see this show, 10,000 a week in the first eight weeks that it was open. Think about it. It's astonishing, 80,000 people. And when they go, they see um, something that's very different, something that's explicitly democratic. Um, there's some wonderful reviews of the show. Here's one from the New York Times. The critic says, I think that no one can see the exhibition without feeling that he is a part of the power of America. It is this inescapable sense of identity, the individual spectator identifying himself with the whole that makes the event so moving. My favorite review was by a, a woman who wrote for the Springfield Sunday Union and Republican, and she said, Road to victory does not mold visitors' opinions, for that word smacks of the fascist concept of dominating men's minds. This was an environment designed to encourage you to practice the participatory and perceptual skills on which democracy depended. If mass media turned off your mind, your reason, turned your unconscious toward a single point of power, this world demanded that you take in images all around, and that you choose what images are most meaningful to you. That you knit those together into a picture of America. Now, again, from our time, we can clearly see that um, the pictures have been carefully selected and arrayed in, in ways that are quite powerful, right? So if we go back to the one I showed before, um, you can see down here, this is Tojo giggling while Pearl Harbor happens over his head. You might imagine that would make an American audience angry. Even so, people felt this as enormously freeing. So, coffee break. Mm. Thanks. So this is what I'm calling the democratic surround. The democratic surround is an idea that hovers just below the surface of a lot of social theory, of a lot of exhibitions, of a lot of art in this period. And it's an idea that lives in a very particular social community centered around sociologists, psychologists, and anthropologists. And early computer scientists. <laughs> so, um, how, I just I, I want to I want to figure out how deep I need to go. How many of you have heard of the Macy conferences? Okay, great, thanks. All right, for folks who may not have heard of the Macy conferences, they were a series of conferences actually begun at about the same time as the Committee for National Morale in New York, and they were conferences at which Norbert Wiener, um, who is not in this picture, he missed this particular one in '53. Um, Norbert Wiener and a group around him framed up what he would call in his book, the hum uh, first in his, what he would call in 1948, cybernetics. Cybernetics was at the time um, perceived as a discipline of information theory, but as Jeff and others have pointed out, it was also a kind of universal discipline. Mm -hmm. It was a notion that the world was made of information that information technology could map, model, and manage the world, and that those who controlled information technologies could themselves map, master, manage the world, and were the proper people to do it. Now, the interesting thing, right, that, the way that I just told that, it sounds sort of top down, I don't mean it to, because these folks were in deep conversation with members of the Committee for National Morale, particularly Margaret Mead, who is right here, and they're deeply concerned 
to help computing become a force for democratization. And the language and the frameworks that they use for democratization are all about interactivity, feedback, self-formation of the kind that I just showed you in the art world. My point here is that the art world and the world of computer science are in conversation with each other through traceable people. Those people are moving back and forth, and the ideas are moving with them. Let me give you a sense of what this sounds like at the conferences or, or soon after. Um, so I want to read to you just a little bit of what Norbert Wiener said. Um, Norbert Wiener, a uh, person who coined the term cybernetics, famous uh, professor at MIT, um, wrote a very famous early paper uh, on um, feedback processes as organizing processes, believed deeply in democracy, very liberal in the classic Cold War sense kind of person, very much an anti-fascist. He said this, in the ant community, each worker performs its proper functions. There is a separate caste of soldiers. Certainly highly specialized individuals perform the functions of king and queen. So hierarchy, military, kings and queens. If man were to adopt this community as a pattern, you would live in a fascist state, in which ideally each individual is conditioned from birth for his proper occupation, in which rulers are perpetually rulers, soldiers, um, forever soldiers, and the peasant is never more than a peasant, and the worker is doomed to be a worker. It is the thesis of this chapter, which is in his book, The Human Use of Human Beings, that this aspiration of the fascist for a human state based on the model of the ant is due to a profound misapprehension of both the nature of the ants and the nature of man. In Wiener's view, we are not inhabitants of a hierarchy, nor is nature itself hierarchical. Rather, we are information-seeking organisms. We are like computers with sensors in our hands and eyes. We reach out, forgive me, we reach out and we touch, and like, oh, living being, okay? Wouldn't have been weird if it wasn't, huh? Yeah. Um, you know, or we look and we say, oh, chair. And then we adjust our behavior in relation to that. This notion that we form ourselves in relation to others and that democracy depends on our constant interformation is at the heart of interaction theory in computer science and at the heart of democratic politics in the Cold War. <laughs> All right. Um, I thought you might enjoy this. This is, this is the book I was just quoting, The Human Use of Human Beings. And you know, cover designers don't always talk with their authors, but I thought you might like to see what the fantasy of feedback looked like a little bit in the period, right? <laughs> it, notice the colors and the computation. You have a computer that's been riven in two and humanized. You have a red, white, and blue color scheme. Computation, the nation, and the person are all needing to be in a state of constant feedback. If you haven't read it recently, I really encourage you to go back and read The Human Use of Human Beings. It's a lovely book. It, it cheers me every day. <laughs> All right. So by the early 50s, the democratic surround is fully established. And I won't walk you through, through all of it, but I want to point out that from World War II, it migrates to the counterculture down two routes. One route is through propaganda expositions that take place predominantly overseas, sponsored by the United States Information Agency. And the other route is actually and ironically through art worlds, especially the work of John Cage. And I'll talk more about that momentarily. Um, I, as I tell it in the book, there's a, there are a lot of examples, and I'm not going to walk you through all those now. What I do want to do, though, is give you some examples in each, along each stream, and then point out that computation is intensely involved in both worlds. Computers and computer people are seen as emblems of the new world to come, as people who uniquely understand its properties. Uh, and they're very involved in both of these worlds. So let me walk you through what these worlds look like. On the propaganda side, <laughs> there's some wild examples. This is my personal favorite. I'll take you to 1959. This is the American National Exhibition in Moscow. Um, you remember the kitchen debates, Khrushchev and Nixon? This is where they happen. They happen down in the lower right-hand corner there. Okay. What happened was this. Khrushchev went on television in America and got kind of angry at his interviewer. And he said, ah, oh, you guys, you Americans. Look, if you think you're so great, I'll let you have an exhibition in Moscow if you let me have an exhibition in Manhattan. America said, no problem. We are all over that. So we gave them some space in Manhattan. And 
the leaders of America's major corporations, the state, our propaganda enterprise, we gathered ourselves together and mounted an enormous exhibition in Moscow, in Sokolniki Park. Two million people saw the show in its first 10 months. Okay. What they saw there was, was an enormous complex. The heart of the complex was what you see here, a geodesic dome, a glittering golden geodesic dome designed by Buckminster Fuller. And then inside the dome, a seven screen display that's about mm, 30 feet across for each screen called Glimpses of the USA by Ray and Charles Eames, the designers. At the time that they created this, Ray and Charles were just in love with cybernetics. And they were also in love with the democratic surround theory of multimedia. They believed, with their United States Information Agency interlocutors, that exposing Soviets to these screens would in fact force them to perceptually engage in the choice making that was the definition of democracy. Okay, lest you think I'm a crazy, lest you think I'm nuts, um, I have to tell you about um, one of the most um, strange and disturbing finds I've ever had in an archive. I was at the United States, in United States Information Agency archive, which is in Maryland. Um, mm -hmm. I'm reading along in these recently declassified documents, and I come across a document that lays out America's overseas pavilion policy. It was fascinating. And it starts like this. It says, we need to build, we, we, we as a propaganda agency need to behave like psychotherapists. <coughs> we need to identify and study the condition of our target population. What is their psychological relationship to freedom? We need to stage a mediated intervention. And then we need to test to see if the inter intervention took. Okay, and that set American policy overseas. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a therapeutic environment. <laughs> it's designed to convert you to democracy. This is what it looked like when you walked in. Um, you can see the seven screens hovering overhead. Um, this is a little bit of the family of man, which was staged nearby. Um, there are boats in a park. There are a lot of consumer goods around. And at th by this time, the politics of choice and the politics of consumption have come together. <coughs> but this isn't only a, a, an environment full of choice. It's also an environment full of monitoring. Uh, the IBM Corporation donated a Raymac computer to the exhibition, and it was pre-programmed to answer 4,000 possible questions that the Soviets would ask. And this is an interpreter sent by IBM. He speaks Russian. He, he interprets the questions, asks them of the computer. Now, <laughs> you all will be surprised to learn that, um, the, yes, the computer answered questions and showed how up-to-date we were technologically. But it also, and perhaps its prime mission, was to record the questions. Because we didn't know much about the Soviets at this time. We just didn't know them that much. We had 20 undergraduates who spoke Russian from around the United States stationed around the park answering questions. And the Russians were amazed. These, the, the Americans would talk about anything. They were simply blown away. Some of them were African American. That was incredible to the Russians. But at the end of the day, each of those, Russians, each of those uh, Soviet uh, American Russian speakers were debriefed by the USIA, and reports of what they were asked sent back to headquarters. Um, this is a wonderful thing to study, because the records of it are incredibly complete. The USIA tracked every possible interaction with the exhibition. All the press coverage across the Soviet Union and Europe was collected, press coverage in the United States, and it's all available in Washington. So it, it's really an incredible thing. My point here is that this is a space in which therapeutic transformation depends on modeling and monitoring. And it's not the only one. Here's John Cage. Um, John Cage, for those who might be, I'm looking around, I'm just I'm feeling, feeling my age. Um, if I have some coffee, I'll feel younger. Hang on. Mm. So John Cage, for those who might, might not have grown up in his shadow as I did, was a pianist, um, a, a musician. And he's a musician who, um, I was always told, had a kind of countercultural awakening. He met an Indian woman in the 50s, and she turned him on to the mysteries of the East. I hope you're hearing the cliche here. Um, and he uh, began to sort of dissect composition and produce environmental sound works. His most famous environmental sound work is something called 433, in which he set a piano on a stage, sent his, his uh, pianist David Tudor out to sit at the piano. He sat down. He didn't play the piano. He just sat down. 
for four minutes and 33 seconds. Okay? At one point he listed the lid just to give people some variety. <laughs> but the point was that people were supposed to hear the environment of sounds around them and to recognize that the world itself was making music. So that's John Cage. And the story I was always told was that he came to this view because he was such a hipster. Um, it turns out not to be true. <laughs> um, Cage was actually someone who was in New York during World War II. He was a, a draft dodger. Um, he claimed that his wife at the time um, was ill and he had to take care of her. I've seen pictures of them. That was a lie. Um, but he was someone who was deeply invested in the aesthetics of the surround, but from an audio, an audio vision. He was also deeply obsessed with patriotic rhetoric. And when he described music in the 40s, he described it in uh, you know, fascinatingly um, patriotic terms. <clears throat> See if I can find a good, good example of this. Um, oh, we lost the page. Well, um, he basically said, when we hear electronic music, we will hear the music of freedom. Right now, we are in a battle, a battle that in 1941 was in Europe as well as at home. We are in a battle for the future of the American soul. And we will triumph by transforming our sonic world. So the sort of patriotism behind the surround vision animates a lot of his early work. As soon as you go back into his early history, you see it. It also animates the rise of countercultural art. So here we are in 1952 at Black Mountain College. Black Mountain College, you may know, is, um, had, was the Cold War center for avant-garde art in America, particularly painting and poetry. It was also a center for training democratic citizens. Um, say a bit about that. Um, it was founded in the, thir I found it in 31, 32. Um, one of its original founders, John Andrew Rice, said that the artist is the proper measure of the democratic man, and creativity is the foundation of democracy. That's an interesting notion, right? When you went to Black Mountain College, this is the other great archival moment I ever had. OK, so all right, back up. 1948, John Cage and his then lover, Merce Cunningham, spend the summer at Black Mountain College with Buckminster Fuller teaching summer school. I found a summer school, um, summer school uh, students' schedule, their calendar. Guess what classes they were taking? Oh, I love this. They were making architecture with Buckminster Fuller, music with John Cage, dance with Merce Cunningham, painting with Willem de Kooning. Okay? All right, so that would be enough, right? You'd be pretty excited, right? But they were taking two other courses one in culture and personality anthropology, and the other in the workings of the United Nations. Black Mountain College was always a place in which the arts and social theory of culture and personality were twinned. It was meant to be a surround, a democratic surround, in which you would experience one another, choose who you wanted to be with and how you wanted to be, and to build a working democracy from there. In 1952, that belief took form in what has since been labeled the first happening. In the first happening, um, somebody climbed a ladder and read a poem. Cage played some music, um, somebody danced around, a dog ran through the room, and at the end of it, a bunch of people put teacups on chairs. And this set off shockwaves all the way from rural North Carolina to New York. Seen from our own time, it's a bit baffling, right? Like, why would such a random performance be so meaningful to people? Why would it be just so resonant for them? I think the answer is that in this time, that kind of surround randomness is an emblem of the possibility of interaction, the possibility of feedback, the possibility of making your own aesthetic choices. It's precisely the opposite of mass media. It's precisely the opposite of one-to-many media. So it feels like freedom, I think, is the answer. Uh, it's a long story, and I tell it at great length in the book. I can try to tell it very quickly here. In the late 50s, Cage moves to New York. He teaches um, musical composition, which is actually a course in how to build happenings, uh, to the people who actually lead the happenings of the early 1960s, people like Alan Capro. I want to pause for a, a note here. Um, in, the, in the 1940s, the democratic surround was an extraordinarily egalitarian form politically. By the 1950s, people were showing images of former enemies, the Japanese, the Germans, and asking us to empathize with them as equal people. 
People like Ruth Benedict, as early as 1941, were crying out against American racism. In 1950, a leading Chicago philosopher, Charles Morris, published a book called The Open Self, in which he called for the demasculinization of American society and the rise of all different kinds of sexual preference. It was very widely circulated. There was a much more politically radical America back in the late 40s and the early 50s than anyone remembers. McCarthy was hardly representative. Okay, given that that's the case, it is all the more depressing when we come to the 60s. I was shocked when I went and looked at the happenings of the early 1960s to see that the politics of the 40s and 50s had melted away, even as the, set, the aesthetic of the surround had stayed. People of color, not in sight. Women? Women were um, draped in wet sheets, naked underneath, and told to stand still. Some had their mouths stuffed with vegetables. <laughs> there were no leading female happeners except for a couple. Um, Carolee Schneemann is probably the most well-known. Um, Yoko Ono was another. But even Yoko made her bones by covering her body in whipped cream, her naked body in whipped cream, and inviting wh uh, white male audiences up onto, the street, up onto the stage to lick it off. She also, one of her other famous performances was, putting her was having her clothes snipped off by members of the audience. So you know, people have told me that those were feminist acts. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. By the early 1960s, the anti-racist, anti-discriminatory gender politics of the late 40s and early 50s had melted away. We've actually entered into something that's a lot closer to our own time, a more consumerist world. But that's a bit of a digression. I wanted you just though, to see what happenings looked like by this time. Here's a B-in from 1966 um, by the US Company, a group very, very suffused with cybernetic ideals. They believe that people can enter this space and have a simultaneously cybernetic and democratic visual experience. They can be bombarded with um, vibrations, which have begun to take the place of information in their thinking, um, and begin to experience themselves as part of a whole system. And that language of whole system permeates the 1960s. I go deep on that in the book, and you can read about it there. What I want to do now, though, is show you one example of how this plays out in computational terms. So this is something called the Pepsi Pavilion. It was established in, built in 1970 by a group called Experiments in Art and Technology, led by Billy Kluver, an engineer at Bell Labs in New Jersey, and a group of artists associated with that. Um, it was built, uh, commissioned by Pepsi, uh, for the Osaka World's Fair of 1970. And it's a pretty fascinating space. Um, I'll give you the heads up. It's a walking computer. That's how they're conceiving of it, OK? So this is actually the tunnel entrance. So I'm going to take you inside in a second. These are cybernetic organisms, they're pro in the view of the designers. They are programmed um, little wheelie devices that do this. They make the, they, they, they I'm not going to pick on you again. Thanks, sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, you're up. Okay, so I'm the little wheelie device, all right? I'm just I'm motoring along. I bump up next to Eugenia. I realize that she's there. And I make noise and I go away, okay? The children are fascinated by these. They demonstrate Norbert Wiener's principle of feedback. And at the time, they were envisioned as making visible a kind of human machine democracy. We would begin to have a kind of equality between humans and machines. And even if we couldn't have that equality, well, at least in your encounter with me, my little bubble self, you would experience a democratic feedback-based interaction. Now, that's even before you enter the pavilion. Okay. So now you enter the pavilion, and this is what it looks like design-wise. So that's the tube that you just saw. You enter, you walk underneath through something called the clam room, which is filled with lasers. And then you walk up into what is a giant mirror suspended by a vacuum. It's a mylar mirror suspended by a vacuum. And it has this very peculiar effect, and I'll show it to you in a moment. The peculiar effect is that when you and your friends stand here, you see yourself reflected upside down in three dimensions over your head. And here's what it kind of looks like. So this is, here you are inside that dome, right? Here are, your, here are your friends up above. In many ways, this is the apogee of the kind of environment I've been telling you about. This is a space in which you're not even looking at art. You're looking at mirrors of yourself, reflections of yourself and your friends, and beginning to imagine yourself as part of a society in which you share equal relations with everyone around you, and 
you get to know yourself better by looking up at yourself. Um, selfies lately? <laughs> Yeah, okay, I think you get where we're going here. <laughs> but the other thing that's important to know about this environment was that it was entirely programmed. And it was, they thought of this as a computer. Now, they didn't actually use computers in the traditional sense. They, they did use um, lights that were controlled by punch paper tape programs. Uh, and the artist was called a programmer. And I think one of the things that's going on here, and I, and I owe this idea to Jeff, is um, what we think of it as legitimacy exchange. Computer scientists who's, who are relatively illegitimate social actors in 1970 in the wake of the Vietnam War gain a kind of cool by being associated with art. Mm. And artists gain a kind of cool by being associated with and able to manage the machines that map and model the informational world that cybernetics has shown to exist. It's a trade. But it's a trade in which these people are both very free in the space that they're in and very carefully managed. And here they are um, having what was meant at the time to be a cybernetic experience. One of the coolest parts of this building, and I'd love to go back in time and see it, um, was a, a floor space where different squares on the floor produced, when you walked over them, with a little handheld telephone device, sounds. So one sounded like your feet were moving through grass. Another sounded like you were working on pebbles. You were living the cybernetic circuit the ground was literally giving you feedback through the information device in your ear. Now again, this is very powerful as an aesthetic experience, but what happens if Pepsi is giving you the feedback through your feet? And it's whispering to you, Pepsi, 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 Pepsi. <laughs> right? Or what if it's one of your friends whispering to you, get a job, get a job, get a job, get a job. Or whatever your friend might whisper to you, that's what my friend whispered to me. Um, okay. Well, at one level, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to a kind of happy ending to the story. You know, in 1967, um, a huge festival took place in Golden Gate Park in, in San Francisco. It's called the Human Bee Inn. And the Human Bee Inn was the apogee of everything Margaret Mead wanted for the democratic surround. People were free. They painted their bodies. They moved flexibly through the park. 100,000 people went. Jefferson Airplane played. Baba Ram Dass spoke, um, Allen Ginsberg chanted, Timothy Leary chanted, um, turn on, tune in, drop out, that's where he chanted it. You may have heard the song, if you're going to San Francisco, put a flower in your hair. It was written for this event, or written about this event. Um, and so, it, you know, I wish I could tell you that this is a story of liberation. Um, that was the kind of story I wanted to tell. So, it's a mixed bag. On the one hand, this idea of the democratic surround and of the modes of interactivity that it solicits that are associated also with cybernetics in the period are a very powerful alternative to the world of mass media, the one-to-many, everybody sees the same thing world of radio in this period. It is, you know, visiting the Family of Man exhibition and having control over your body as you move through it, looking up, looking down, being with different kinds of people, seeing different kinds of people. That is generally, genuinely liberating in a world that is hierarchical and still overtly racist and, and problematic in so many different ways. But the democratic surround also marks the rise of a new mode of managerial power. You know, we may have escaped Hermann Goering by the skin of our teeth, but if you look at this picture, you'll see something that, that continues to fascinate and disturb me. These folks are totally free in their own space. But they have no idea what's going on on the other side of the wall. Or that there even is a wall to have another side with. There are stage managers back there. In many ways, they're not in the world. They're in a play. They're on stage. And ladies and gentlemen, I think that's where we live now. This is the Computer Consumer Electronics Show in 2010 in Las Vegas. And it's a precise replica of the 1970 Pepsi Pavilion. Okay. So, um, I wish I could say we were freer. I can say that we've tried. I hope we keep trying. Thank you very much. Okay, see a question in the back? Yeah. That wonderful, rich material. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, but especially given where you end up with the, the somber tones, I'm, I'm wondering why 
there's so much kind of implicit democratic triumphalism throughout. Yeah, sure. Um, so I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know, but this stuff doesn't go back just to the 1940s. This, you're offering a kind of very popular front account of democracy as the principal antagonist to fascism. But you're also calling attention to the way in which the surround, for example, is not exactly the same as interactivity for a collective. Yep. And you can find verbatim, I mean, the, 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 the dichotomy that you're laying out exists in the 1936 second draft of Walter Benjamin's art on the mechanical reproduction mm -hmm. of you know, the essay. Yep. In which the alternative to fascist use of propaganda is not democracy, right? It's it's wrecked, it's epic theater, it's interactivity. Right. He sees right. in even in the cinema yep. the ability of the crowd to kind of come into some sense of itself mm -hmm. collectively. And so where you end up in the talk is in some sense a function of where you're dating this from yep. and how you're casting it as a function of democracy. And I wonder if the story really changes if you go back and you think of Communism as an antagonist right. of fascism in the 1930s. Right. Or you can even go back to yep. Dada, which is where a lot of the happening of Black Mountain stuff is coming from. Again, so the, I mean, I don't imagine yep. you don't know any of this, but, yep. but, the, but the problem that you end with is a function of the role you give democracy as the engine of a lot of these developments. Great. So that's a really important point, and let me, let me address it. Uh, I, I think the first thing is to, absolutely, is to be very careful to sort out what I think from what my actors think. I think this is, this is really important. I am not arguing that multi-screen environments are perforce democratizing, though my actors are. Okay, I want to, want to lay that out really importantly. The second thing that's very important to me is to note that the communities that I've studied in the 40s and 50s are directly interpersonally connected over time to where the story ends up. So, I, so, so it's, um, it's, there are many struggles around media and democracy, performance and democracy, the definition of community, communities versus crowds. Um, I lopped off, I actually wrote two chapters on the issues that you've described and then lopped them off because they made the book so sort of front heavy. But more because the communities that I'm studying here and the aesthetics they develop really travel together over time in a very coherent kind of way. And I wanted to surface that. And I wanted to surface the coherence of that, that project. Um, so when you say that I, I end where I end because of choices that I made, it, it, I mean, it's, true at a, it's true at a narrative level, but I don't think it's true um, at a historical level. I, I think at a historical level, the communities that end where I've ended come together in the places where I've marked them as coming together. Um, they, they aren't popular front. They're very different. They don't want to be part of that. Um, the other thing that I think is important to, to recognize, it's very difficult when we have the history of the popular front so in front of us. And so Michael Denning is one of my heroes. He's written the defining book, I think, on that period. Um, we, I inherited an American history that said there used to be a genuine democratic movement in America in the 30s. It got crushed in the 40s and the 50s. <coughs> It sort of came back with the new left in the 60s. I just think that's not the case. And I think what it does is it, it makes the um, students of the new left who wrote the histories of the 60s that I'm rebelling against heroes of their own story. It completely neglects um, a different world that I didn't even know existed, which was the world in which Margaret Mead and, and, and her crew are fighting on their own terms in ways that we may discount inside the system at its center for what they understand to be racial, gender, sexual preference, liberation. Those are things that were not supposed to exist at all. So I think part of what you're feeling here is me pushing back on um, the, the history that I received. Thanks. No, no, yeah, and I'm happy to go deeper on this, too. No, no, I, I, that's wonderful. And I, and I share your sense of that earlier historiography. And, and I said nothing I said changes the inherent interest here about the 1940s. It, it really was just about the way you're framing it. Yep. But anyway. Yeah. I, 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 I will. I may be wrong. I, I see a lot of my frame emerging from my material. I'm not aware of, I mean, I may, obviously I, I put stuff down on it. Internally, I don't think of it that way. I think of it as something more that I found than something that I built. Yeah. Go. Questions? Other questions? Comments? Go for it. Yeah. You know, I, I was looking to know who is 
interviewing these people while they're still alive? Yeah, okay, great. Great. So that's a great question. I'll just repeat it for the group. Who is interviewing the computer scientists who are between, who are 65 and up, who were involved in those 60s movements and move forward? So I did a lot of my book from counterculture to cyberculture. I, f I foregrounded Stuart Brand, who's not a computer scientist, but was in involved with a lot of them. But I interviewed a lot of programmers from that period, Lee Felsenstein probably most, most aggressively. Um, there's an oral history project um, at Berkeley that's done some of this. Um, we're working on collecting papers at Stanford um, so that people can do more of it. P part of the challenge is, um, and there's a historian named Margaret O'Mara who's working on this now. Um, there are a bunch of us who recognize that it's a critical issue. And from my perspective, the critical issue is to stop telling heroic stories of people like Steve Jobs. I mean, I just think that's, that's, that's the big, uh, it's just hideous in so many ways. And to tell the stories of other communities that are out there. Um, honestly, people are dying too fast. Yes, that's exactly the point. Yeah, and so, right, so, 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 so I just want to tell you I'm on this to the extent that I can be, and my strategy is not to interview as much as to collect materials as rapidly as possible. I, can, I don't have enough students, I can't get enough people out into those spaces. And I can't get enough people properly trained up into why a certain kind of computational modeling is so important to have them go do a proper interview. It takes a while to get a historian to where they actually understand what's going on. Like when I say close to the machine, you know what I mean, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, well, no, my students know. I mean, you want to get some students from computer science departments because there are lots of really interesting technical oh, stuff that what, what I would, in that area that were highly influenced by the drugs that they were Right. Oh, oh, yes. So what I would give for computer science students that don't want to design, you know, that don't want to speed up Google, but actually want to talk to old computer scientists with me. I mean, I would, I would give tons for that. Yeah. Pardon? Good, we can talk. We can, yeah, great. So maybe I need to find them here, you know? I mean, it's, it's, I mean I'd, I'd love that. So. Yay! Like, if you guys yeah. make it, I will preserve it. That's great. That's totally, totally, totally great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I should also say, one of the things that makes me so excited to be here is I feel like there's a kind of social appreciation of the social life of computing here that is not actually as common as I'd like it to be. And, and so... Um, this is our vibe. <laughs> I, know, I know, it's all good. Thank you. Yeah, great, go for it. Well, I came over from the history department to hear this. Oh, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> So of course, what I want to ask you about has nothing to do with history. It's about fiction. Okay. Um, when well, you don't tell me about, my history's a fiction. I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. When you talked about you know Franklin Roosevelt being yeah. the fourth fascist, yep. My first thought was crazy, of course. But then I thought Orwell was when he was writing 1984. He was working for the BBC. He was thinking in terms. So that would. Bit. And I also thought about Philip Roth's uh, plot against America. Oh, uh, right. I haven't read. I haven't read it, I'm sorry to say. Well, I think it would make it easier for you to say, as crazy as it may seem to say America was on the verge of fascism, here's the leading American right. thinker inspired, a leading American yeah. novelist, inspired by kind of groupthink after 9 yeah. 11, yeah. imagining how easily, how tenuous right. democracy right. is. Yeah, yeah. But I'd love to get you to to just ramble on about, you must have thought about the Orwell and Huxley, 1984 is Big Brother watching you, Brave New yeah. World as you're watching a bunch of screens. Yeah. This is a kind of tension running through that. Yeah. And Huxley it, then becomes part of the. Yeah, so I'd, lo I'd love to talk about that. Um, so Huxley and, and Orwell um, are, are intriguing to me, and I, I actually think they've led us a little bit astray as we think about the present. So Orwell and Huxley are working in a world in which there is a top-down centralized power, Big Brother, who is doing all the monitoring. And what that and so people like Steve Jobs have been able to harness are are wanting not to be under the world of Big Brother to say, look, I'm gonna help you I'm gonna help you be free, right? You're gonna carry your computer in your pocket. You're gonna have a kind of independence. You know, nineteen eighty four is not going to be like nineteen eighty four. Very specifically. Do you remember the ad? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, Some of you are too young remember the ad, but um, yeah, I mean smashes the screen with Big Brother. So it's not gonna we're gonna be free now. Okay, so the problem is, right, in making that flip, which Enormous numbers of people in Silicon Valley are still deeply invested in. This, I mean, what I see when I go to Burning Man is an attempt to kind of relive and, and, and repropagate the anti-Big Brother ethos, right? What's, what's gone off there, though, is what Sh Shoshana Zuboff calls the problem of Big Other, um, which is, um, you know, small-scale, ubiquitously distributed monitoring and monetization that, that you know, does a lot of different things. So, so Zuboff wrote this article called Big, Big Other, which is, has blown my mind. It was the best, it's the best thing I've read this year. And she said, um, she described how companies like Google are using information technology to enter into social spaces that are relatively not defended. So Google Street View, they just drive down the street. Takes a while before anybody says, hey, wait a minute. 
No. Okay. Um, likewise, um, you know, my phone, right, tracks me. I, I have to sign a 60-page document to use my phone that says I'm going to get tracked. But I, am, I, am I reading that document? No. You know, do I mind being tracked? Well, not yet. But if Nixon comes for me, yeah, I mind. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this? So, so, so I think that the Big Brother history has caused us to, to miss the kind of thing that I'm trying to get after here, which is ubiquitous micromanagement that adds up to something as pernicious but much harder to challenge. We can, we can imagine ourselves as big heroes against Big Brother throwing hammers into the screen. Who are we going to take arms against? A sea of screens? Um, yeah, more, yeah, go for it. Yeah, we'll send that in the back. Yeah. So really quick, last two questions. Oh, sorry, sorry, last two questions. Okay, we'll get you next. Really, Thanks. really quick, um, given the excitement over the new Star Wars movies, I wondered if you thought through that narrative in terms of this. <laughs> I haven't. That the clones are the, anyway, um, the clones are the good guys. But um, <laughs> also, it's just a process level, have you ever been to Wisdom 2.0? And if that should be your next empirical site, it's Fast. No, I, I have not been to Wisdom 2.0. It's a out. series of conferences held in, in San Francisco, which is trying to be wise about, and uh, it's fascinating. And wise about tech? Well, yeah, and also we can talk more about it. Yeah, we can talk a lot more about it. I mean, I've been thinking for a long time about the intersection of kind of bohemian, ostensibly alternative worlds and very centralized power-based worlds. This is how I come to things like bringing weird art worlds together with, with tech. Um, it's, it, I mean, I might as well be talking about San Francisco. But yeah, that's great. Thank you. Great. Last, last shot. I just wanted to connect the big other to your mention of Tor early on. Yeah. That, you know, even if you connect it, you connect it to where you think you're safe. Well, uh, people have demoed stripping SSL by being a Tor exit node and collecting all this information from people who think they're fundamentally secure. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. No, that's really, so the, the point was that Tor is not fundamentally secure. That's an excellent point. Um, up at NYU, uh, Finn Brunton has, and, and um, Help me here. Somebody knows this book. Um, Helen Nissenbaum, thank you. Finn Brunton and Helen Nissenbaum have just published a set of tactics for sort of low-grade resistance to ubiquitous computing. I haven't read it yet, but it looks very promising. Um, thank you all very much. You've been a great audience, and I really I feel lucky to be here. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Fred. That was fantastic. We'll continue the conversation downstairs. Um, we will be having a conference organized, co-organized by Judith Gregory, uh, Simon Penny, Peter Kraft Industry, and then myself on December 4th, Friday, December 4th, looking at the intersection of art, technology, and design. And mm -hmm. we'll be exploring some of these themes there. So, yeah. All right. Thank you, Thanks, Greg. Dave. That was great. Come drink. Thanks.